Hello to our beloved worldwide viewership. It's James Calm, half assed reporter of the guy on the bike. And we just hustled in from Brooklyn here to Chelsea because we wanted to come by the Timothy Taylor Gallery and catch a pre closing glimpse of Frank Arbach landscapes and portraits. We made it in here before closing time. I'll do a little sweep of the installation. Well, we'll start here. It's titled Head of Julia III, 1999. This is acrylic on board. 11 and 7 eighths by 11 and 7 eighths. Well, this is interesting. I've been watching Frank's work from a distance and I haven't seen a lot of his work that was in acrylic. Well, it says in the press release that this is his first show in New York since 2006. This piece is titled Home 4, 2003, Oil on Board. Uh, as I said, I've been looking at uh, the work of Frank Arbach for at least 30 years and uh, As it says, he hasn't shown in New York for about 12 years. So it's always nice to get a chance to see a master, especially from the, I guess what you would call the London School. Um, this is maybe the largest piece in the show. This is titled Primrose Hill, 1978. Now I know that uh, I think Frank might live in the Primrose Hill neighborhood, but he's done many, many paintings of this neighborhood. Or various landscapes. Uh, I think one of the things that makes his work especially timely is that uh, there's a whole group of young painters and even some West Coast painters from LA that have been looking at, well, not only Arbach's work, but the whole London School and some, some of the other European post-war artists. Um, and Picking up on the paint handling and kind of the gestural qualities, the material qualities of the paint, one of them would be, I think, Lisa Scholnick and Vanessa Prager, and uh, another former California artist who is now living in New York, Dennis Hollingworth, who uh, came by my studio this afternoon. I think they've all been looking at this work. Uh, Locally, there's also a young painter that we've covered, Anna Weeder Blank, who is getting into the paint. This is titled The House, 2015 Oil on Board. Also, I'd like to send a shout out to one of our West Coast viewers, Barry, who emailed me yesterday and begged me to come by and check out the show. And he was, he was hoping they would allow photography. Oh, this is a wonderful piece. This is 
Coco Mornington Crescent Summer Morning, 2006. This is 50 by 50. Okay, it's suddenly dawning on me that uh, a lot of these are squares. Well, I think it was through uh, R.B. Katai that I became aware of a lot of the painters in the London School and started looking at their work. And I've made comments recently that I think there is kind of a, a an awakening of a sense of uh, materialistic painting or painting dealing with the properties of pigment. One of the other major forces in the London School is Leon Kossoff and if you like you can go back and check in the James Com Report files and we've covered at least a couple of his shows. I think also uh, Lucian Freud would be part of that group as well. You know, uh, one of the things that's nice about seeing a show like this is uh, kind of getting to see his his palette because beyond uh, just the, the wonderful use of the the paint and the pigment and the brush strokes uh, is actually a wonderful colorist. Okay, now this side of the gallery is the portraits. Head of JYM3. This is 1981 oil on board, 20 by 22 inches. And this is the kind of work that I first started seeing. I guess at this point it's about 30 years ago. Well, I can see in a lot of the uh, the more recent work that uh, Frank is scraping away a lot more than he's leaving on. This is nice because uh, you really get a chance to see the way that this is built up and it would be interesting to know how long he actually works on some of these. I think he might go back and work over these over a period of years maybe. JYM seated in the Studio 3, 1988. Oil on canvas 29 and 3 quarters by 16. Well, there's a Sotin show up at the Jewish Museum that I'm going to try to get up and see this weekend and uh, this is nice this is kind of like a juicy uh, appetizer for something like that also I'll see if we can capture some of the uh, the various qualities of the surface some of these sections are very dry and matte and then you've got uh, some of these brighter areas that, uh, and they're a little oilier, a little shinier. It's a wonderful contrast. And again, it's a nice, nice palette. This is reclining head of Julia, acrylic on board. 2003 to 2004, 16 by 24 inches.
Okay. I guess that would be the face over here. Head of William Fever, 2016, oil on board. That's another square. This is 20 and a quarter by 20 and a quarter. Well, I love to look at pieces like this, and as I said, I pay attention to the edges because at that point you can sort of see the the history of a painting and uh, as I said you can kind of tell that he's worked on these for a while, scraped them down, reworked them, made some erasures, gone back in, rinsed things off with solvents. Head of JYM, 1984-85 oil and canvas, 26 by 24. Yeah, I think uh, it's very important for uh, Frank to get his his strokes just right and uh, that might be why he, he reworks these. He, might not be quite satisfied with the exact kind of slashing that he needs to represent a form. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to see an almost, uh, like a calligraphy type of, uh, gesture with the strokes. And, uh, yeah, defining his forms with just you know, the perfect uh, twist of the knife or the brush stroke. We'll wrap up looking at this. Reclining head of Julia, 2006, acrylic. And another square, 18 by 18. This is a wonderful study in tones, grays. James Com reporting on Frank Arbach, Landscapes and Portraits, here at the Timothy Taylor Gallery. Can you tell me what the address is here? Yes, yeah, 515 West 19th Street. 515 West 19th Street in Chelsea. just off the Bowery. I've been trying to get into this exhibition for three weeks. And we're gonna try to pop into the Howl space. 
had to show dealing with the young Jean-Michel Basquiat and the people he influenced on the downtown scene here in New York about 30 years ago. Zeitgeist, the art scene of Teenage Basquiat. Um, as I was saying, I have tried to get in here a couple of times. Last weekend I came by and they were celebrating the the birthday of Allen Ginsberg, and they had a public group reading of Howell. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed, running, hysterical, mad, starving down the Negro streets at dawn in search of an angry fix. This is a painting by Bobby G titled B-Boy 1984 and this number is by Fab Five Freddy Jack Johnson well I guess the premise for the show is not so much that they're presenting the work of Jean-Michel, although they got a couple pieces here. It's untitled TV Party Heavy Metal Night, 1981. Okay. Glenn O'Brien had a it was a public TV or alternative TV program that he ran for four or five years during the, the heyday of the downtown scene, which probably was something like 1978 to 1984. And, well, I think Glenn passed away maybe six months ago. This is NFL by Marianne Monfortin. Chicken wire plastic, gauze paint pencil, synthetic mortar and cement. Although this is kind of cheap. This is, nine, this is 2017, 2018. So that's something that Marianne just finished Look at another Basquiat. This piece is famous Negro athletes. Crayon on paper. Fixed Jungle Song, Steady Piano. It's also Jean-Michel, untitled, 11 by eight and a half. Uh, it's a Kenny Scharf, I can tell. As I was saying, I think the, uh, the premise of the exhibition is to show you the, the milieu, the, the whole scene that was happening downtown during that period. The sculpture is titled Magazine, 1980, by Frank Paglia. Polyester, plaster, paper, paint, spray, 
aggregate stone. I think uh, Frank actually had a little blossom, a little flourish of critical recognition back when I first got to New York. He was doing many pieces like this, but a lot of them were capturing sections of walls and buildings that were being torn down or remodeled. And uh, I think he does a great job of uh, kind of capturing the feel of a certain uh, decrepit and crumbling civilization. Jean Michel was actually kind of a ubiquitous presence. A lot of people think that he didn't really come on the scene until maybe the mid 80s and then was known mainly as a painter, but that's not true. He was a musician, poet, who was also running around and uh, I think he actually he and his partner were running around doing a kind of street poetry under the name Samo and uh, John michel was very well known and I guess he ran away from his home in Brooklyn when he was I don't know 15, 16, 17 and I guess was couch surfing for a couple of years this photograph is by Godless Fire St. Mark's Place, 1984. Well, I was uh, fresh onto the scene about this time. I came to New York in 1979 and I was uh, living a little farther uptown. I am man, I eat, I nap, I pee, I mate. I weep in pain and in time. It's by Al Diaz, who was Jean Michel's partner, and as I was saying, they both went around and wrote poetry on walls and signed it Samo, which means something like the same old shit. It's by Ted Barron. Now this is the portrait that's kind of become the uh, the logo for the exhibition. A young Jean Michel with a mohawk. This is by Robert Carithers. Jean Michel Basquiat in front of Todd's Coffee Shop in Soho, 1980. And the door here is by Richard Hamilton, another one of the, I guess you would call them the meteors, the, the, the incredibly hot, uh, famous artists from the Lower East Side who kind of had their two or three years of great success and then pretty much disappeared. I think Richard passed away a couple of years. As a matter of fact, this in certain ways kind of tells you a lot about this show in that many of these artists have died at this point. Now, I'm not sure, but I believe there was also a uh, film that they were screening down here that uh, documented a lot of Jean Michel's early period. This is Charlie Ahern. Battle Station 2018. Charlie's a well-known filmmaker and uh, 
produced Wild Style, one of the first hip hop graffiti films that was starring people like Patty Astor and uh, Lee Quinones. This is Robin Winters. Money, <laughs> just saying, this is the mid 1970s. I kind of like this, it's uh, kind of patina of age on the red velvet. This piece is, each panel is 36 by 24 inches. I was going to say, it is kind of funny, I was talking about the number of people that have passed away that were part of this scene, and I don't even know whether it's even more tragic. <laughs> the people that are still around, many of them have gone into academia and have become, well, college professors, teachers. It's a nice painting by Jane Dixon, Charlie Ahern's wife. Well, Jane has been around the scene for a while, and uh, I think for a year or two, maybe a couple of years, she had a studio up around Times Square. And she would uh, base a lot of her paintings on things that she saw there at night. However, this one it says that it was dated 2016. Samo as an alternative to mind wash religions, bogus philosophies, nowhere politics. Another piece by Al Diaz. This is actually interesting. I don't get a chance to see these very often. These are a couple of the postcards that Jean Michel used to produce and sell. And I guess they were saying his big breakthrough came when Andy Warhol bought a bunch of the postcards. Okay, we'll look briefly at the uh, video. Okay, John spray painting. You know, he only lived to be about 28, maybe 29, but uh, he even looks young, much younger than that here. This is by Barbara S. titled No Titled, Woman with Knife, 1985. These photos are by Vivian Dick. Tessa Hughes Freeland Countdown 2018. 
16 millimeter film, wood and glue. This is a photograph by Alexis Adler. Untitled, shaved head, number 10. Naked lunch from Basquiat on East 12th Street, 1979 and 80. Justin Lada, monster with a whiskey glass bonnet. Okay. It's gum bicarbonate on red cedar wood. As I said, I think Jean Michel was a kind of a mascot for this whole scene. This is by Nan Golden. You Are Not, 1981 original poster. And I think that uh, you know he was a he was an inspiration and. Uh, of a guide for a lot of people. He was young, ambitious, good looking, intelligent. This is anonymous. Philip Bordaz. James Neris. Becky Holland. I think a lot of these artists were also involved in collab. This is a downtown cooperative. This is also by Becky. Smudge Pot, Hot Hot Bomb, 1981. It's a piece by Christy Rupp titled Rubble Rats and uh, Christy actually made a career out of uh, depicting rats and uh, doing on-site installations with rats and rat posters and rat bumper stickers and all kinds of references to rats. Walter Robinson, fight tyranny in all forms, 1984 acrylic on canvas, 60 by 50 inches. Walter was quite engaged in the scene. I think uh, he and a couple of other people had a uh, magazine that they published. It was, I think it was Art Right and some other things and uh, Walter eventually went on and was working for Art in America for a while. He and Carla McCormick in many ways were the the chroniclers of the the East Village scene. And uh, you know, Walter's actually had quite a uh, revival of his career in the last three or four years and uh, has become kind of a superstar. Luke Sante, title page from Stranded number four. And we've got some little pieces by Jim Jarmusch the director. <laughs> We're going to uh, finish up looking at a couple of these last pieces. This is by our old friend Brett De Palma, 
It's titled Dr. Frankenstein, or Frankenstein. Uh, the last time we came here to How Happening, we uh, got Brett to give us a little walkthrough of his exhibition there. You can go back and check on it. I think it's in the James Calm Report. This piece is acrylic on canvas from 1984. And Brett was also a big part of the scene. Okay, this is a large, unstretched piece by Lee Kinonis. Well, he was also just known as Lee, and uh, he kind of had a legendary uh, career in the early mid-80s. He was the star of Wild Style in Lady Pink and Patty Astor, and he was he was touted as like the king of the graffiti writers, and basically that was because he could actually paint. You know, he could draw and paint. Bobby G, ABC No Rio poster. I spoke with Bobby G the night before last about the show. I like this piece. Colleen Fitzgibbon and Robin Winters. Gun Money Plate, 1980. And we've got a poster from PS1 announcing New York New Wave it was created by Diego Cortez. And that was maybe one of the first times that I saw Jean-Michel's work. Well, I will just say that I think the the echoes, the influences, the the energy that Jean-Michel put out, and uh, the way that he influenced a lot of other young people who are now not so young. God, I hate to think about it. This was. 35 years ago, something like that. Uh, his influence has still echoed down the uh, hallways of art history. James Calm reporting on Zeitgeist, the art scene of teenage Basquiat. Here at How Happening, an Arturo Vega project, 6 East 1st Street. You can like this, share it, and subscribe. You can leave your comments, ideas, suggestions below. And help me with this, folks. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.